uh, we have one more candidate. It looks like Erica, let's, uh, let's bring you in. My name is Erica Reddick. I am a Burlington resident. I live in the new north end of Burlington, born and raised uh, Vermonter and went to Champlain College, got a bachelor's degree in accounting. And so a lot of the time you'll hear me talking about my campaign, it's centered around the economy uh, and finances, taxes, things like that. That's especially because of my background and specialty in accounting and helping businesses really thrive in troubling times. So I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm a small business consultant. I literally help businesses recover from the brink of bankruptcy and trouble. So a lot of times it's not that there are major problems uh, with the business. It's just maybe they don't understand how the economics work. Maybe they need to raise their prices. Maybe they need to adjust some of the things that they're doing. But most importantly, what you wanna do is you wanna take a step back with any business and you wanna measure the things that you're doing and see if they are effective and providing the results that you hoped for. So what I see a lot in the Vermont State Legislature uh, currently is if something is not working, the solution is raise taxes and add more money to the problem. And so I just really would love for us to, instead of uh, adding the burden uh, to the already struggling residents that we have here, what I would really like to see is us opening up our economy. So the Economist Magazine and other, uh, other publications have rated Vermont a terrible place to do business. Uh, they literally rated us 49th in business friendliness. That's why you see businesses moving out of here at a staggering rate. That's why you see middle class and starting families leaving Vermont. We do have, uh, in fact, a, um, a population decline. So we're actually losing people. And the only people that are moving in are very wealthy, uh, who are not necessarily contributing to the economy by running businesses and doing things like that. They're making Vermont their second home. And so if we want to be able to provide all of the services that I've heard everyone talk about tonight, if we want to be able to provide uh, justice, equity, and all of those things, we need money to do it. And unfortunately, we cannot tax uh, the wealthy and middle class, even if we taxed them at 100%, it would still not be enough to cover the $5 billion debt we're facing here in Vermont. So love to hear the wins from our current legislators, but they have, some of them, gone on record as saying that they are not going to address the $4.5 billion pension deficit. And that was pre-COVID. So that was pre-COVID, before the stock market crash, and before anyone realized that their estimates were on a 7.5% return, which is not feasible. So uh, then we had a $500 million budget shortfall, which makes a total of $5 billion, and that was pre-COVID. So if, if, if there's not enough money here, if we can't extract enough in taxes out of the people who already live here and the businesses that already exist, what we need to do is grow our tax base. Two ways you can raise taxes or raise revenue if you're a municipality, you can raise people's taxes like we do here in Vermont all of the time uh, and make it suffocating so that people just leave. Or we can open up the economy, open up segments of the economy. We can deregulate uh, some of the land use laws so that people can build enough apartment buildings to house the people that we have here. That in turn will lower the cost of living and it'll lower property values so that the property taxes will equal out, more people will be paying in and then we'll have enough to make it. This idea, this tax and spend policy and the way that our current legislators do it, I just don't think they understand that Vermonters just can't pay anymore. They just can't pay anymore. And so if we encourage people to move in here, we encourage businesses to move in here, we will increase our tax base, we'll have enough money to afford all of those things. And then with that, we'll also be able to address 
the staggering mental health and drug abuse crisis crises that we're facing here in the state of Vermont. A lot of people don't realize this, but 30% of suicides are because of lack of employment and opportunity. So our Vermont legislature is passing gun laws that they're saying is intended to prevent suicides, but they're not addressing the lack of jobs and the lack of opportunity, which causes at least 30% of those suicides. And so with this lockdown, uh, you know, Yes, it's great. We have good num good COVID numbers. We've only lost about 60 people here in the state of Vermont, but we've had more than double the suicides and more than double the drug overdoses because of these lockdowns. So, you know, we want to do the right things, but we need to measure and test and make sure that the things that we're doing are effective. It sounds great that our numbers are low in COVID, but when you factor in the real cost and how many lives we've lost as a result of these policies, you know, I just don't see it as a win. It's just hard to see it as a win when so many more people are dying and suffering, can't afford to feed their children and things like that. So uh, I, I don't know how much time I have. I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't track it. Oh, I still have five minutes. Oh my God, that was well, yeah for like uh, your entire time slot. So if you want Q and A, okay, great, um, perfect. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Kevin. That was nice. um, yeah. I'm happy to take questions. Cool. Uh, raise your little blue hand if anyone's got a question for Erica, or uh, or anyone who's a panelist. Just give a good wave. I'll expand out so I can see all of you. All right. Anybody? Oh, we got a, oh, Barbara, Barbara, all right. Yeah. Um, go, on, go ahead, yeah. Yes, thank you for unmuting me. Um, Erica, so I, I just want to make sure I understand you correctly. Um, so you're not in agreement with the way Governor Scott has, has governed to keep Vermonters safe? Do you, th you think his closing down of things has been too aggressive? Is that, is that what you're saying? That is what I'm saying, yes. Okay, I just wanted to check that out. It just seems to me that businesses, putting the public safety issues behind us, if we can, it just seems to me that it's short, to think that businesses and movies and all the things that you want to see reopen, that we all want to see reopen can happen when it's not safe to do so. They can open to their hearts contained. People will not, come if it's not safe and that that is where i think that reasoning is just backward backwards i okay, don't mean to say so, we're back so, but. okay so you would so you're okay with the increase in suicides and drug overdoses the three gang shootings that we've had in the new north end the uh oh. Thirty percent increase in calls I, for child abuse. I do not, to, I do not oh, attribute um, them to to the pandemic or the close down. So I really do not. Oh. And I don't think that you can prove that they are attributable to that. I'm I'm finished. Thank the you. increase in domestic violence and the increase in child abuse and the increase in drug overdoses and suicides. You don't believe we can connect to to a major. Uh, shutdown of the economy where people lose the ability to take care of their families, where children are now at home all day with abusive parents. Our responsibility then home. is to make sure those people have the wherewithal to do so, not not to make Vermonters unsafe because they do not. Thank you. Oh, okay. I just I, no, I want to agree, unfortunately. Yeah. Erica, I want to add that, you know, as somebody who is affiliated with the school system, of course, we have been alerted to the need for more um, interactions, both in person and online with vulnerable populations in reaction to the shutdown, to social distancing, to online learning but not not but that but that is not saying we should open everything up as in we 
I, just give me one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I want to say we believe the CDC guidelines and the standards and whatever we're following is actually keeping us healthy. I know you're talking about abuse and, you know, pe when people are left alone, yes, they are more susceptible to their vices. That is unfortunate. But when they are out and about, they're susceptible to COVID. And we're, and, and we know, you know, I, I just want to say heroin addiction is not addictive. You don't stand in line with somebody who's an addict and then like catch it. It's different, right? So we oh. are trying, does that sound weird to you? Oh yeah, I, I you must not have anyone in your family that's a drug addict, and that's I a do actually. Oh, okay, well then, plenty. Then just say and that I can tell you right now, being in, since, being since, being in the same room with them does not mean that I can catch a virus that will make me an addict. Okay, the difference. But they do science. affect the people around them, don't they? Of course they do. And right, and I'm not saying people have should all, go around. But what I'm, I'm not saying, saying is, we have. We already had these family members. We've mm -hmm. already been dealing with addiction and crime and, and, okay. and yeah, and, and okay. Can, may, I, may I now and respond? Now, may I now respond? Give me one more second. And now we are more isolated, but I can tell you that the efforts should not be about opening up our, our community it, it doesn't make sense. Yes, we should make an effort to have more in-person connections with the people in need, not just say carte blanche. Yeah, everybody, let's meet up on the street. And yes, Great. respond all you want. Thank uh, you, I'm done. Yeah. Well, I, I don't believe what I said was everyone should just leave their house and go start licking doorknobs and spitting in each other's faces and like making out with strangers. like. I'm, I'm nearly certain I didn't say that. Uh, what I did say, however, was that we need to put people back to work and we need to open up our economy responsibly. There are many other states that are less restricted that are not having crazy numbers. And I think that that's reasonable. I've talked to educators, many educators, para-educators especially, who are talking about the devastating effects, the masks and all of these things are gonna have on developmental, uh, how they're gonna create developmental issues in our children. And so again, we're just gonna to have to agree to disagree that all of the consequences and all of the harm and damage that we're doing to our most vulnerable is a equal trade-off. I, I just, I'm not convinced not when I see the suffering. Kevin, you're muted. All right, uh, so anyway, um, we have one more question for you, Erica, uh, from Patrick. Uh, go ahead, Patrick. Erica, it's uh, really nice to hear uh, a Republican opinion in a mostly progressive ward uh, where most of us <laughs> are pretty tight knit and look out for each other and have been socialists for far longer than Bernie was here. Um, that said, it, it is not my opinion. I don't necessarily share it with you, uh, but it is refreshing to hear a little bit different opinion. Um, so are you saying that a lot of stuff you're, it's, you seem to be saying is in the benefit of hindsight? We don't have a lot of data that says uh, that told us in the beginning of this that if we kept our businesses open and our economy going, that we wouldn't have incurred more deaths um, due to COVID than we would have that we're seeing because of drug overdose. We don't have that benefit. We don't have the science data that shows our children are going to have cognitive issues. We just don't, people are saying that, but we won't know. Um, and the safety of all of us depends on all of us doing it together. And I'm not sure if I'm mishearing you. And 
because you have a Republican point of view, which is, you know, appreciated, and I won't deny that it is a valued opinion, um, but I'm a little confused by if the, the, the information you're sharing with us, it just, I don't know where you're getting it because there's no causation correlation for a lot of what you're saying. We just don't know the other side of if we didn't do something. And yet you seem to uh, imply that, you know, you have that data. The other thing is, I heard you speak a lot about businesses, a lot about businesses um, as a small business owner. I live with a small business owner. You know, we, I don't know if uh, <laughs> a lot of what you're saying about small businesses is true. Um, which part? You know, which part? Uh, getting people back. We're, we're all doing pretty well. I think the governor's a Republican. He's done a pretty good job with making sure a lot of us in the small business field, human, health, human services, medical, have kept going. There's going to be a lot of businesses that fail. And I, and I see that those businesses were largely teetering. Um, it's, it strikes me. And this is what hyperbole, it's my opinion, but no data. Um, I don't know if it's the right thing to do to just open it up and, and wish and hope. We have data that shows what happens when disease spreads based upon uh, well, we also. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I apologize. No, no, uh, I should stop because you should, you're, you're running, not me. <laughs> no, they're good questions. I just sometimes forget that you're, I'm not, it's not a conversation, you know? So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. True enough. And let people finish. Um, I will say we do have evidence of, of things. So there are plenty of states throughout the country that are similarly um, set up as Vermont, very rural, very few urban centers. Uh, and they did not have as harsh of a lockdown as we did. And they don't have spiking numbers. They're not out of control. You look at states like South Dakota um, even parts of Texas uh, were not hit in the rural areas. So Houston had a spike, Dallas had a spike, you know, the major cities where everyone is sort of on top of each other, that's where you were having a lot of the problems. A lot of the riots and things like that um, brought spikes. Um, but the data that I gave you for businesses, so two things. Uh, I don't say anything that I can't back up with facts. So um, as far as the suicide statistics, um, I looked those up earlier this year because I wanted to compare our COVID numbers. I wanted to be really um, certain that I was, that to see what was happening. And as of May, as of May, so two months into the lockdown, suicides and drug overdoses were already double. Uh, the- But can you say, can you say that those numbers wouldn't have been the same had we have not imposed restrictions? Because, because the only if we had lost the projection, if we had lost what we'd lost in 1917, the amount of depression and suicide of losing entire families may have been greater. And that's fine. If, if we did this through May, June, maybe even June. I don't know if I would call it fine. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying, I'm saying at a certain point, when you start to get some data in and when you start to see the effect of what's happening, you have to make a different decision. And the fact that we're still under emergency orders in September, when the vast majority of the country is almost wholly back to work. We're um, the only state that is, does not have any community spread. We are the top state in terms of effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's great. Not to say. And, and that is really great. And so- How did we get here though? Why so wait, hold on. Did we get here? Patrick, let me ask you this. How much more are you willing to sacrifice? How much more do you think the people who are unable to feed their children, the people who are, who are having their homes foreclosed on, all of the people who are suffering from this lockdown that have lost their businesses, up to 30% will not restart and they were not teetering businesses. Of all of those, how many more people do you believe should have to suffer we're allowed as Vermonters to make our own decisions. 
I do. I can't disagree. You're going to be willing to trust are. your neighbors to make good decisions. How many people would have suffered if we didn't, if we don't continue? We just don't know. We're doing the best we can with the limited amount of data. Next time it happens, we'll, I think you would have a better point with better data. I don't think, I Anyways, think the only I don't people. Want to make it, it'll, we all have the benefit of hindsight. Common sense, I think, is a really important thing. Is that what you just said? I'm sorry. Well, it was... It's not very common, but I, I, I do hear you actually have a solid opinion more than a lot of the Republican end of what I hear. You actually present yourself very, very well. And I do appreciate well, thank it. you. It is very I, hard to overcome the prejudice against conservatives here in Chittenden County. It is you, you, you probably share a lot more common values with the rest of us than you realize. Because we do. And this is what is so unfortunate about it. It's why I took out a whole page ad in the seven days voter guide and I called it debunking myths about conservatives. Here's the belief that somehow I, not. I, I'm just going right. to, I'm going to pop in here just for a sec, just because I'm just looking at the time. Uh, we are just about running out of time and we still haven't heard from our three school board members who have been waiting patiently. So Kevin, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I hope you don't mind that I just sort of jumped in there. No, thank you. Thank you. Not at all. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you the for same. the extra time. Thank you. Thank you. Erica, Erica and Patrick, I really appreciate the conversation you just had. And Erica, I hope you maybe will, uh, I'm one of the patiently school board members. Erica, I hope you maybe like set up a Zoom for us to further this conversation because I agree with Patrick. It's been, I'm interested. I want to talk more. I'll, I'll email Patrick. I see yeah. it on here. Yeah. I see his yeah. email. Yeah. I'll email him. Yeah. Cool. Um, and also it looks like there's a, uh, there was a question from Brian Chena, but also same, same deal, uh, connects after sounds like a bigger conversation. Um, thank you, Erica, for, uh, for being here and, uh, you know, giving us your time and whatnot. And yeah, appreciate you.